Welcome to the FY 2012 for fiscal year 2013 proposed operating budget for the Prince George's County Board of Education. This is a public hearing. I ask that you turn off your wireless communications as they tend to interfere with the taping of the meeting. Is Council Member Patricia Dennison from the Town of Berwyn Heights present? Okay. Ms. Jackson, call the roll, please. Ms. Normwood? Ms. Beck? Ms. Boston? Present. Mr. Barrows? Ms. Eubanks? Here. Ms. Jackson? Present. Ms. Johnson? Ms. Waller? Present. Ms. Higgins? Present. Ms. Jacobs? Present. Thank you. Thank you. The Board of Education has convened this evening for the sole purpose of listening to public comment with regard to our FY 2013 proposed budget by Superintendent Height. There are a few highlights that we would like to note in Superintendent Height's proposal. For FY 2013, the proposed operating budget updates. $1.6 billion spending plan reflects a stable fiscal outlook, mainly reductions in central office and support areas. Reductions will not be as drastic as they have been in years past. The governor has introduced a budget um, as of January 24th, and based on the new proposal, the superintendent has submitted to us a supplemental budget that includes $33 million in increase over last year, which brings our total budget to $1.647 billion. This includes $9 million in investments in employee compensation, continued investment in programs such as middle college, secondary school reform, and the expansion of grades for current charter schools. The four priorities indicated by Superintendent Hyde in his proposal are funding student needs, innovation, fiscal stability, and supporting employees. The budget goals are as follows. To keep reductions away from the classroom and instruction. To set aside funding for employee pay raises depending on negotiations with bargaining units. To address structural needs and realign systems. To allow adequate investment in student needs, teaching, and learning. To build on our fiscal stability. Empowering school, teacher, school leaders to design unique instructional models that meet student needs, which goes to the core of the student-based budgeting. Promoting transparency in funding decisions and enabling the central office to responsibly support schools in a culture of innovation. The new student-based budgeting system will provide schools with direct control over their budgets and limit reductions away from the classroom. For more information on student-based budgeting, which, is, which was piloted last year and being implemented at, at full um, complement this year, please go to our website at www.pgcps.org. Colleagues, we will now hear from speakers that have registered for public comment who will speak for three minutes in a public forum. The Board of Education will listen to your comments and only respond to the extent necessary to clarify any um, misconceptions or misleadings regarding the budget proposal. We have 21 registered speakers this evening. The board would not address the comments, as I said. But at the sound of the buzzer, we ask that you please complete the sentence that you are on only. You may not relinquish any part of your speaking time to a registered or unregistered speaker. We ask that you use titles rather than names. Your adherence to these guidelines will ensure that public comment goes smoothly. Our first speaker for this evening is Alexa Molina, a third grade student at Calverton Elementary School. Please come forward. I'm, okay, so I, I'm going to call the students for the uh, Calverton students, um, Calverton Elementary School students, any of those students present in the audience? Okay, seeing none, I am going to move to uh, our next uh, list, which is uh, the Honorable Patricia Dennison, Council Member, Town of Berwyn Heights. Next on our list um, is Priscilla Coleman. Lynette Trusk. Come on up. You're Bradley. Of course you are. Come on up. Thank you, Ms. Bradley. Oh, thank you. Good evening, Dr. Height, board members, and guests. 
My name is Linda Bradley and I'm a media specialist at three elementary schools this year. Since other programs such as Reading Recovery have been cut or eliminated along with half of the librarians last year, a vital library media center with a full-time specialist can help to bridge the gap for students who are not being served by these other programs. For example, a certified full-time media specialist can advise and assist teachers on books that are appropriate for individual children. As often happens in elementary schools, if a media specialist is part-time, his or her day is so filled with teaching classes and circulating books that there is not enough time to meet individual needs of students or classroom teachers or to impact student achievement as effectively. For example, at my base school this year, book circulation has de decreased about 40% compared to the same time period last year. The tag classes in another of my schools um, while it's on the schedule, have not been seen for some weeks due to different time constraints and a few scheduling problems since I'm only, um, since they're only allotted a point four position at that school also. In the early 1980s, deep cuts were made to the program and elementary school librarians were ha made half time at many schools. It took almost 30 years to get back to where we were previously with a full time librarian in each school. In this digital age, it is imperative that students have access to their school library and certified personnel. The concern in the past has been equity for all students. Without a mandate from the board to restore full-time librarians to all schools, inequity will occur again. Even though the plan is that under school-based, I mean, excuse me, student-based budgeting, the money will follow the students to the school that they attend, other factors such as PTA involvement or the ELL population, et cetera, will affect the individual school's budget and will result in discrepancies in how much money is spent on specific programs. Schools have difficulty prioritizing needs and spending. As you vote on Thursday on the budget, we urge you to reinstate full-time media specialists, if possible, with some of the additional state funding that our county is to receive. At the very least, please continue to fund full-time librarians in the high schools. Several states, including Texas, Arizona, California, and Indiana, use the reading scores of second, third, and fourth graders to determine how many prison cells that they will be needing in the next decade. 70% of American prison inmates fall into the, two, the lowest two levels of reading proficiency. 85% of juvenile offenders have reading difficulties. Illiteracy is also related to unemployment. These and similar statistics are widely available from sources such as Forbes magazine and the National Institute for Literacy. MSDE and the county, okay. Oh, I can finish my sentence. Uh, MSDE and county school boards are remiss if they don't do everything in their power to promote literacy skills for all students. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bradley. Linda Langer. Tony, if you want to come on up and join the choir. Good I would like to thank the school board and the superintendent for providing an opportunity for me to speak. I found a pertinent quote on the Richland College website that I would like to share. As a college librarian, I am amazed by the lack of research skills that most of the students have when they get here. I also heard the same remarks from college professors at a conference I attended last summer. Students must be career and college ready. That is exactly why our students require a certified and qualified full-time library media specialist who is well equipped to teach them how to efficiently and effectively locate, evaluate, and use information hidden in an ocean of facts. Library media specialists also collaborate with teachers to design lessons and research information for their curriculum. In addition, library media specialists are expert users of virtual resources. We train students and staff to use our virtual resource, the OPEC catalog, which includes 25 unique databases and is purchased by the Office of Library Media Services. I would also like to share some student comments that were communicated to me through a survey. Okay. 
These were from High Point High School students. If school library hours are reduced to half time, how will it impact your education? It will impact my education dramatically. I wouldn't have the aid and rich services, resources. I will not be able to do quick research before class. I won't have any interesting books to read. I won't get to turn in projects and I will get really bad grades. I will not have a quiet place to finish my work due to my honors and AP classes. I won't be able to turn in a lot of assignments. I would have a rage face, I'm not sure what that is. I would have a rage face the whole day. I wouldn't be able to redo research and print in school because of the reduced hours. It would affect me because I use the library often, so the library has to be open. I won't have too much, uh, much time to do my schoolwork, research, and print some work I need. I will have a poor education. Having library hours cut would be simply absurd. That's like owning a car but not having any gas. It will affect my work ethics. It will have an impact on my education and could lower my grades on projects that need research. It will impact my reading. It will impact my education because I won't have enough time to complete any homework that I need to do research on and I will not have enough time to compete, complete any work that I can't complete at home. I would have less sources to go to. It would be a bad thing because I do most of my school projects in the school library. I wouldn't like it because studying in the library has improved my grades. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I have copies of these. Ms. Ando Otto. And next is Curry Rose Hosky. Good evening, I'm Tony Andolfato. In response to the need for a virtual library, we already have one. For almost 10 years, we have offered resource materials online. We are a member of the MDK-12 Digital Library Consortium. Parents and students have access to the resources 24-7, home and at school. However, not all of our students have access to the equipment and broadband needed to make use of these wonderful resources. The school library's re re reference section has been online for over five years. In high schools especially, it is essential that the library is open and staffed with, the, with professionals who can empower and engage the learner. I will now continue with the High Point students' comments. If school library hours are reduced to half time, I wouldn't have the quiet atmosphere to read my school subject related materials. I also wouldn't be prepared for certain classes as well. If the time were cut in half, it would be useless to come to the library. I would not be able to print projects or essays because I, have, I may not have time. It will impact my education because whenever we have projects to do, we come to the library to finish them. I also enjoy reading. Reading is the best because it prevents me from getting bored. Sometimes reading helps me. How can I be more successful in life and be happy? I will not be passing my classes. I'm going to fail. It would be useless to even open the library. I wouldn't have access to books that teachers assign me to read. Well, when we have a project due, we need the school library for research. I wouldn't like it because I come to the library to get help from the librarian. It will affect students who do not have transportation to a public library. I wouldn't have a quiet place to study before school starts. I come to the library to get help in school and from the librarian. I would lose my sanity. The library helps me sink into the school day when I don't want to go to school. It will really affect students that depend on the services the library provides. It will impact my education because I am trying to learn English. I am trying to learn English, so it is important to have a school library. I need the library to read and do my homework on the computer. The school library is very important to me. I would not do school work, flunk out of school, become a bum, and die a nobody on the streets of Maryland. I use the school library to do my projects. I don't have a printer at home. I go to the library to do my homework. It will be bad because I, I always go to the library to do work. I often use the school library to do my homework. 
I learn from books that help me. It isn't, it isn't good the library would be closed in the morning and after school. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Curry Rose Hosky. Dr. Height, ladies and gentlemen of the board and community members, thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. My name is Curry Rose Hosky, and I'm a Prince George's County homeowner and I'm part of a two educator family. My husband teaches at Fairmont Heights High School. We are the parents of a preschooler who one day will attend a Prince George's County Public School. I am also, I am also fortunate to be one of the county's library media specialists. And ladies and gentlemen, I am still not your mother's librarian. However, this year, it seems like I'm everybody else's librarian. You see, I'm your librarian at Berwyn Heights Elementary, but I'm also your librarian at Paint Branch Elementary, and I'm your one-day-a-week librarian at Greenbelt Elementary. What that means is that 60% of the time, my students at each school have no real access to library media services, not on the days when I'm assigned to one of my other schools. That's 60% less access to the tools and culture of literacy. We all know that increased access to books fosters a love of books and reading. Well, folks, that access is down 60% this year and most likely will be down 50% next year. In one of my three schools, as Ms. Bradley mentioned, book circulation is down by 40% from last year. Now, I'm guessing that if any MSA test scores were, draw, were down 40% over the course of a 12-month period, we would all be hearing about it and trying to fix it. The sad fact behind these numbers is that our students are missing out on valuable literacy opportunities. Your youngest constituents are the ones who have had to sacrifice the most under this deleterious staffing formula. Every time a student checks out a book or views a great technology resource, we are giving him a chance to learn, to experience, ideally to imagine and create. That's what goes into literacy, and literacy is essential for student achievement. That's what's being cut when you reduce library media positions in each school, the fundamental building blocks for student success. Yesterday, President's Day, I reflected on the words of Abraham Lincoln at Gettysburg when, in the midst of a devastating war, he reminded his people of the fundamental concept of our nation, that all men are created equal. I ask you, our Board of Education, are not all students created equal? If so, then why this inequitable staffing formula? Why should some students receive full-time library media services and some should not simply on the basis of where they live or how far their principal's budget can stretch? Yesterday, the Gazette reported that millions of dollars in state funding are projected to be allocated to our schools. Please put restoring full-time library media specialists at the top of your wish list for some of these funds so that all of our students can develop 21st century skills and strategies they need to be successful students and productive citizens. Our county students, all of our county students, deserve no less. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hosky, and I just wanted to remind you that last year you sang to us. <laughs> 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 Thank you so much. Maurice McNeil. Good evening, Superintendent, board members, and other school officials. I am Jamaris Butler McNeil, a parent of a fourth grader at Seabrook Elementary School in Atlanta, Maryland. My comments are based on the board's four guiding principles for student-based budgeting but I'm gonna sprinkle that with a bit of reality for Seabrook Elementary School and what other schools could potentially face for fiscal year 2013. Per the guidelines, the school budgeting process should be, according to the first principle, student-focused. The reality, school student-based budgeting methodology treats the schools as if they are all the same. The budget allocation of $3,077 per student may work well for one school but not another. For example, this school year, Seabrook Elementary 
is already operating without a full-time assistant principal, guidance counselor, librarian, and nurse. Where is the student focus when a child is in need of one of these school professionals? Where is the student's focus when photocopy paper is rationed out to the teachers? It got to a point where I personally purchased a case of photocopy paper for my son's teachers so that they could make sure that every student had a copy of something and extras if a student was lost something. The second principle is equitable. The reality is I understand the perceived parity of the student-based budgeting. However, the approach penalizes small schools, especially schools that performed well. Seabrook has year over year performed well on the Maryland School Assessment, earning the school the distinction of exemplary school in a previous year. Ironically, under the student-based budgeting, Seabrook would only be eligible for additional funding if the school's performance was subpar. Now, would any reasonable or responsible administrator risk student assessment or performance to receive additional funding? Is this not a penalty for performing well? The third principle, transparent or transparency. The reality, the school board continues to seek community input on such matters. Tonight's forum is an example of that. The last principle, flexible. The reality, under student-based budgeting, Seabrook is facing an operating deficit which represents a challenge with flexibility. Where is this flexibility when an administrator must choose between purchasing school supplies, offering other student activities, or eliminating four or five positions, which is the case for Seabrook? These positions are not discretionary. How much more can be trimmed from a school's budget before it becomes marred and, self, marred and low self-esteem? Thank you. You have copies of my report there. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McNeil. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Height, I have two others on the list, but I think I'm going to yield back to you because I think there needs to, you need to explain how the um, formula is supposed to work for, for schools where kids are doing well. We can't, you know, in other words, the, the budget is supposed to be designed for um, student base. Principals make the decision. There are students who are not doing well, but there's also a category for high achievement that should be accounted for. So I'd like for you to take a look at that. Um, Donna Larahas. Andre, a four, year, four and a half year old with autism, comes to music once a week for 20 minutes. He rocks back and forth holding a toy he brings with him, which is difficult for him to put down unless you replace it with something like a maraca. Andre doesn't get up to dance with other students, resisting physical prompts. But when Andre sees me in the hall, he starts to sing, Alouette, gentle Alouette, which is a song he learned in my music class. Andre is functioning in less than the one percentile in all developmental areas. In 2009, U.S. Secretary of Education Arne Duncan released a letter asserting that the Elementary and Secondary Education Act defines the arts as a core subject and the arts play a significant role in children's development and learning process. Discrepancies like Andre's widen as they age, requiring a lifetime of special services. Our special education students need music to help close these gaps. Music is a core subject. IDEA says that children with disabilities have available to them the same programs and services available to non-disabled children, including music. And while IDEA does require that children be taught in least restrictive environment, it also includes provisions for what is free and appropriate for children with special needs. Sometimes students with special needs are mainstreamed into general education music class, but without support. Music class is much more than listening to or singing pretty songs. First grade students are already reading simple rhythms and improvising ostinati. 
Students like Andre, who showed development well below their same age peers, have difficulty accessing the general education curriculum and often have competing inappropriate behaviors. A general education music class without proper support is not appropriate for students with severe needs. A bridge between music and special education modeled after the adapted physical education department is needed. Music goals will be added to IEPs when deemed educationally necessary to foster language, social, physical, and cognitive development. Music special education instructional specialists would support inclusion of students who are able to be included in general education music classes and offer separate classes for children who need them. Current music department support staff should not be cut. There is a dire need for even more support. Regardless of placement in special or general education classes, Comar states that programs in fine arts, including music, shall be provided to all students in grades K through 8 and fine arts electives for students grades 9 through 12. Please take all necessary steps to ensure that all Prince George's County students have equal access to appropriate music programs, including preschool students and students in regional schools and programs who are our most vulnerable and difficult to teach students. Thank you. Thank you. Teresa Saunders. President, Prince George's County Parent Teacher Association Council. Ms. Saunders. The Honorable Patricia Dennison, Council Member, Town of Irwin Heights. Good evening, Chair Good evening. Jacobs and uh, the Board of Education. I am here tonight in support of restoring full-time libraries to the schools in Prince George's County and also Dr. Hyde. Um, whether student achievement is measured by standardized reading achievement tests or by global assessments of learning, Research shows that a well-stocked library staffed by a certified library media specialist has a positive impact on student achievement, regardless of the socioeconomical or education levels of the community. I am a, an avid library supporter of public libraries and school libraries for children for some children in Prince George's County, having a school library open five days a week or will be their only chance to have contact with a book or have somebody read them a book because maybe their parents are working two jobs just to make it right now. But I have some statistics here. I did some research and I, I apologize for being late. What the research tells us in schools with well-stocked, well-equipped school libraries managed by qualified and motivated professional teacher librarians, one can expect capable and avid readers, learnings who, learners who are information literate, teachers who are partnering with the teacher librarian to create high quality learning experience. Standardized scores tend to be 10 to 20% higher in schools without this investment. Better school libraries are related to higher achievement in reading children who attend schools with libraries, school libraries with better collections and superior staffing do better on tests of reading. Students learn more and produce better research projects following planned integrated information skills instructions by the teacher and teacher librarian together. A properly staffed, appropriately stocked, and well-organized school library is a critical tool that allows librarians and teachers to work together to help students achieve higher le levels of literacy, problem solving, information, and communication technology skills. What the experts say, individual and corporate success now depends on lifelong learn learning information literacy and research competencies and the ability to wade through the ocean of information washing over us daily. We have to acknowledge that it is critical, that it is a critical requirement of the future employment rec market, sorry, that we are preparing our students to enter. A strong library media program is a, in a school, well, I'm leaving both of these articles for you. I had no prepared remarks but thank you for considering having full-time libraries in the schools, if we can do it. 
Thank you so much for your comments. I will yield to Dr. Height. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you um, to State your name for the record. Lynette Trusky. Okay, Ms. Trusky. Go right ahead. Good evening, Dr. Height and members of the school board. My name is Lynette Trusky, and I'm a Prince George's County resident, a parent of two Prince George's County graduates, and one more, I hope, very soon. And I am a teacher, and I have been employed by PGCPS for 10 years as an elementary vocal music teacher. I taught in Montgomery County for the 10 years before that. And throughout my 20-year career as a vocal music educator, advocacy has always been mandatory. Because <laughs> when budgets get tight, the arts are often considered expendable, not essential. And I would like to challenge that belief tonight. I truly believe that you are the most informed generation of school officials that I have ever had the privilege to speak with before. Because there is a wealth of research available now, such as learning in the arts and student academic and social development, which analyzes the results of 62 such studies. And in Goals 2000, the Educate America Act, our government set into law the subjects that should be taught in all American schools, and the arts were included. With no child left behind, our country required national standards to be set forth for all educators in all subject areas, including the arts, which is why we now have the National Standards of Music created by the Music Educators National Conference. There is no longer any doubt that a high quality arts education is an essential part of a complete education. And I would like to thank you for your past support of this ideal. I am here tonight to ask you to continue that support. The students and parents of Prince George's County deserve a high quality arts education program and highly qualified teachers to teach it. And when I first came to Prince George's County, there was a great deal of diversity amongst the backgrounds of our music teaching staff. There were many, many gifted and talented music teachers working with our children, but there was a lack of common practice and continuity of instruction throughout the county. And I can honestly say that over the past 10 years, this has changed. Because of your past support, the nationally recognized music curriculum, Spotlight on Music, was purchased for every school in the county. This new resource brought equality to the music resources available at every school. And then you increased the music department's administrative staff by adding an instructional specialist. You took it away after one year, but then you brought it back. And I believe this is why you are seeing such an increase in national recognition for Prince George's County music ensembles. From performing at the BET Honors, competing in the Glee National Choir Competition, being nominated for a Grammy, and or performing the debut of a new choral composition at Carnegie Hall in New York City, our music students are on the map. It has been through the addition of an instructional specialist to our music office staff that has been the manpower, given us the additional instructional manpower to focus on bringing in high quality professional development opportunities and ongoing in-service training that is targeted at our greatest instructional needs. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Trask. Please read the rest of my letter. <laughs> we will. Dr. Height. Before I start, Madam Chair, I'm just making sure we don't have any more individuals. I don't know if Ms. Coleman is here. Anyone here who signed up to speak tonight that um, have not yet spoken? Okay. Great. Thank you. And, and thank you, Madam Chair, for providing an opportunity to clarify some of the information. And I also want to thank all of the individuals who participated in tonight's public hearing and to all of the individuals who participated either in a work session uh, or a public hearing that has been held in and around the county. The, um, there was one individual who spoke publicly that indicated um, the, the base funding. And although it is base funding, the funding doesn't end there. So the base funding is an amount that all students receive. It's a weight. Um, but it's not the only amount. Um, and in addition to that base funding, there are additional dollars that are, that are attached to additional weights. And some of those are grade level. So kindergarten and first grade students get additional monies, as well as sixth graders, both in elementary schools and in K-8s and middle schools. Ninth graders get additional money still. 
Students who uh, qualify for free and reduced lunch also get additional monies. Students who are low performing um, in elementary, middle, and in K-8s, and in high school get additional monies, but the converse of that is we also provide additional resources for uh, students and schools that are high performing uh, in all of those categories. And then the final additional weights apply to the English language learners, both at the K to one, second to nine, and 10 to 12 years, both at beginner level, intermediate levels, and advanced levels. And I just wanna also add, Madam Chair, that it is our intent using this process to push as much money as we possibly can back into the accounts for schools. In so doing that, this budget includes 10 million additional dollars in monies to schools that are unlocked, it means that it's discretionary. But as indicated by the previous uh, speaker, there's also a significant amount of monies that's in addition to schools that's locked as well. So monies for K-8 vocal music, for PE, for creative and performing arts, uh, for secondary school reform, for moving media specialists to a smaller fraction of the day to a higher fraction of the day. So all of that is with a view towards trying to push as much additional monies to schools as possible. So hopefully that responded to um, your question, but I also want to make sure we clarify that the foundation or the base funding is a, is a funding amount that's applied to every student and it goes to every school but it doesn't stop there. There are more monies that are associated with certain factors, awaiting factors for all of our students. Thank you, Dr. Height. And I think um, th that was to my point. I wanted to at least have you explain that. And while there's going to be still some differences at individual schools, um, you know, I still encourage have the principals, you know, work with the parent, the PTA, and work with the individuals who are really working hard at the individual schools to, to understand that so that when they do see anomalies, they can either un they understand how it works um, or then they have a basis for making maybe a different argument. Okay. Um, thank you, colleagues. That actually concludes our public comment for this evening. Thank you all for your participation. Um, Mr. Coleman does have the copies of, of the um, comments that have been left, and the board will receive those. Um, that concludes public comment. We are adjourned at 740. Thank you.